awoke at 5.30 a.m. on the morning of July 6, 2016, feeling like I had the whole world in front of me. I dressed quietly for my early morning bike ride to train for my first half Ironman triathlon, trying not to wake my husband of less than a month who was sleeping next to me. I was excited to go into my PhD lab later that day to work on what would become my second first author peer-reviewed publication. And I paused as I walked out the door. Could this kind of happiness last? Two hours later, I was laying face down in the dirt with my now mangled bike on top of me. And I knew that my gut intuition had been right. That type of happiness that I'd glimpsed walking out the door that morning wasn't for me. Because you see, this hadn't been the first trauma that I'd experienced in my relatively short life. In fact, it wasn't even the first time I was being wheeled into UNC Hospital feeling like my body had betrayed me. I grew up as a nerd with glasses and braces and the highest grade in every class my social status in middle school was pretty firmly cemented. Because at my small, private Christian high school, the best thing that a woman could be was not smart and ambitious, but desirable to men. And the primary determinant of a woman's attractiveness in the late 2000s was her body's weight, shape, and size. I'm not trying to say that societal pressures around body size didn't exist prior to the late 2000s, but I do think that in 2010, thinness began to pervade society in a truly insidious way. Popular clothing brands began to not only make zero sizes for girls, but negative sizes, telling women that not only should we take up no space, but we should actually take up negative space. Fad diets abounded, from the more conventional Whole30 to the truly inane apple cider vinegar. Suddenly, what individuals, and particularly women, put in our bodies was not only the most interesting thing about us, but the primary determinant of our health and worth. I dropped 20% of my body weight and entered high school eating less than 600 calories a day. At my age and activity level, my daily energy needs would have been roughly three times that. I was starving myself to such an extreme degree that my heart was at risk of giving out. Living day to day was a painful experience, constantly shivering and becoming lightheaded from ascending a single flight of stairs. It got to the point where one morning that fall, I woke up to be told that I wasn't going to school that day and my dad wasn't going to work. Instead, I was driven to UNC Hospital and checked into treatment for my eating disorder. I missed over a month of school. I cried as I had to follow an aggressive refeeding program that felt like the months of undoing of the restrictive eating. I fought against therapists telling me that my body was worthy of taking up space and that I deserved a life of health and happiness. But I began to believe it, and I began to embrace recovery. Then I returned to high school. I would enter a classroom, and male classmates would taunt me, gosh, Sloan, you're so fat. Teachers heard and did nothing. The institution responsible for my well-being not only condoned this bullying, but participated in it. A male teacher called out my eating habits in class. The classmates who bullied me were promoted to leadership positions within the school. As my class approached high school graduation, my status as valedictorian was contested despite me having the highest GPA because I had had to miss school due to treatment. When I was voted most likely to succeed, the yearbook editor forced the photo of me and the male awardee to be him proposing to me with a large ring because the only way a woman could be successful in that world was through a man. Throughout my youth, individuals and institutions were allowed to degrade my mental and physical self-worth with no consequences. But I couldn't talk about that in my valedictorian speech. I couldn't point out that the very traumas that I experienced in this environment had contributed to a severe mental health disorder. And it reinforced 
that for me, success and safety in this world would often look like just enduring. So when I was wheeled out of UNC Hospital on my 23rd birthday with three broken vertebrae, a broken tibia, and a diagnosis of PTSD, it somehow made sense. I didn't get to be happy. All of my injuries were treated non-surgically with a wait and see approach. A small piece of vertebrae had broken off and migrated into my spinal column, but not far enough to where they wanted to operate unless it moved more. It was my job to lie as still as possible for two months and hope that it fused back together. And so I did. I laid there through the discovery that I had landed in a patch of poison ivy and the oils had had a full week to permeate what felt like every inch of my body. I laid there through the humiliation of my husband having to bring a hospital toilet into our bedroom. I laid there through weaning off the myriad of opioids that I was on. And I endured. I mastered out of my PhD program and began working at the intersection of science and business. I went to therapy, both psychological and physical, to deal with the various traumas I had endured. I relearned to walk, eventually to swim. After two subsequent knee surgeries, I even began to run. I got back on my bike. And I crossed the finish line of that half Iron Man, crying as I realized that my body was both strong and mine. It's one of the clearest memories I have where I was able to marry what I consider my superpower of endurance with a true feeling of thriving happiness. And then trauma struck again. I was violently sexually assaulted. I spoke up. I wasn't believed despite having physical evidence. And the self-worth and belief that I was deserving of happiness all came crashing down. But this time, Going back to just enduring wasn't enough. I had been harmed and violated to the very core of who I was. So I quit my six-figure job to found a company that allows for measures of trauma to be measured continuously and in real time. I worked without a salary for almost a year and dug into my savings because I was sick of trauma not being taken seriously. Objective data around trauma is extremely hard to obtain. One person's triggers and their responses to trauma is going to look vastly different from another's. That is why the way that we measure and treat trauma has to be individualized as well. That is what my company, eSentience, has been able to do. We make a wearable sensor that's able to detect responses of panic, injury, and stress in real time and respond automatically to bring that user out of a panicked state. My trauma has certainly given me a platform. I'm standing on a TEDx stage. But when I talk about what motivated me to start my company, I explain that my PTSD is still triggered from a vehicle coming over my left shoulder. I don't talk about my eating disorder or my sexual assault, because as a society, there are still types of trauma that we can't or don't talk about in the open. And I fall into that pitfall as well. I would not have chosen this platform of trauma. In fact, not a day goes by that I don't wonder what my life would look like if some of this trauma had passed me by. But it would be a pitfall of the highest order if I perpetuated the narrative that there are some traumas that are okay to talk about while others should be swept under the rug. So I'll commit to building a world where we have better sensors that change the lives of trauma survivors. But I'll also commit to a world where I keep talking about the things that we usually don't talk about when we talk about trauma. Thank you.